开叉是吗？我不知道，我开全。而你就包着。<咳>嗯、morning, uh, Hello. Hi. Uh, Good morning, Shin. Hello. Hi. So, I know today's topic is about Asian hate crimes. Yeah. Yeah. So, when you are facing uh, uh, racial, discri racial discrimination, where you are from, what would you do about it? Hmm. Well, it's a good question, and uh, I must say, during the six years I was abroad, I had a relatively overall pleasant experience. Maybe because I I know what I was doing, you know, I always project a uh, confident image of myself and uh, always busy, you know, running from A to B. So I guess, and I don't go out in in places where I might um, encounter this kind of experience. But if if one would ask, um, well, what would ask, what I would do, I would say, uh, you know, this English phrase, keep calm and carry on. You know, yeah. be really calm. And um, carry on what you're about to do. But I think in the middle, I'll add one more phrase, which is push back. You know, if if you're really subject, if you really encounter some very abusive language or even physical threat, I would not be shy to push back. But I would do it in a very dignified way, and uh, yeah, to to let people know that you know, don't think we are we're chickens that you can bully. Be very careful what you do with us. I don't want to offend you, but please don't mess with me. That would be the kind of message. But then, I'll carry on. You know, there are good people, bad people everywhere. We have to carry on our business and uh, fight the fight, one step at a time. What would you do? Uh, have you encountered this kind of experience? I haven't, though. So, yeah, um, I've been studying for like half a year and got back to China, mm -hmm. but. Uh, those people were kindly to me. Mm. In America? Yeah. Yeah. What would you do if you ever had that kind of experience? Uh, I'll probably talk to my university mm. and report. Yeah. Uh, talk to my advisor. Yeah. And if it gets too uh, serious, yeah. I'll try to call the police and mm. let them encounter it. Yeah. I guess the situation varies, right? It depends on what kind of uh, discrimination you're faced with. If it is really dangerous, people coming to you physically, then I, sh then I say you, you really need to talk to the police, report on it, or to talk to the school authority. But if it's some kind of hidden, you know, day-to-day -day body language or, or insinuation, I would say, yeah, you have to, you have to deal with it in a dig dignified way. But still, not be shy of defending yourself. Right. Yeah. So uh, I prepared this board for today. Mm -hmm. So is there anything you want to add on? Of course. <laughs> That's our topic today. And I'm going to use my lipstick just to give it a big cross. Stop Asian hate. That's our topic today. All right. Thank you. Thank and you. Good luck with it. Thank you.
Welcome to Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point with me, Liu Xin. In this segment, I'll dissect stories that are making headlines around the world and talk to my guests to compensate for the missing pieces of the puzzle. So join me in real time by sending us your comments or questions via the CGTN page on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube or Weibo. If you're watching this live on the CGTN application, email me at thepointwithlx at cgtn.com. Let me know what you think. We air the Headline Buster segment on Fridays at 11 a.m. Beijing time. Do get in touch and I just might read out your comments. This week, we're going to talk about a tough topic, hate crimes against Asians. First, let's take a look at some viewer comments on this. By um, Bill 2018-03, it's a backlash. The Trump administration is accountable for the vicious spike for elimination of such crimes, smearing and slender China should be stopped. Unfortunately, Biden is still on Trump's track against China. From LYX24, how can a country with these many racial problems within its border has the guts of accusing other countries' human rights situation? It seems they don't even care about their own people's right. The basic human right is the right to live. Many thanks to these comments and please keep them coming. So we get into today's topic. I'm not going to be busting any headlines today. Rather, I'll be looking at how the media is portraying the story and what they are saying about the factors fueling the spike. When did it all start and why? How much of a role have politicians played? And given all the red flag incidents we've seen since last year, why wasn't more done sooner? First, the news. A series of mass shootings occurred at three different spas in the area of Atlanta, Georgia on March the 16th. Eight people were killed and one wounded. The suspect, a 21-year-old white male, was taken into custody later that day, charged with eight counts of murder. Despite the fact that six of the eight victims were Asian women, local law enforcement hasn't called the mass shooting a hate crime, meaning a prejudice a prejudice-motivated crime that targets someone because of their membership or perceived membership of a certain social group, religion or race. The local law enforcement spokesperson Captain Jay Baker offered his own insights into the crime, saying that the suspect was pretty much fed up and kind of at the end of his rope. Yesterday, he said, was a really bad day for him and that's what he did. A sex addiction was suggested as the motive. When asked if the shooting might have been a hate crime, Atlanta Police Chief Rodney Bryan responded, we're still early in this investigation, so we cannot make that determination at this moment. The responses have triggered a cascade of criticism. Some say the comments come across as justification for mass murder. Others say the allusion to the shooter's alleged sex addiction sounds like victim blaming. And yet others say the empathy shown for the shooter is one more example of white privilege and a systemic refusal to acknowledge that racism exists in American society. Many of these points were raised in a commentary piece from Rolling Stone called The Excuse We Make for White Male Murderers. The article says the local law enforcement press conference inadvertently demonstrated the lengths to which people in this country will go to justify or even excuse the reprehensible actions of a white man, particularly one whose victims were marginalized members of society. The article adds that by telling the media that the attack did not appear to be racially motivated, the officer, intentionally or not, erased the complex and interlocking issues of racism and misogyny that could exist at the heart of the attack. And that by emphasizing that the victims allegedly tempted the shooter, law enforcement officials made the women complicit and were then also able to downplay any perceived racial biases behind the attack. By the way, no evidence has emerged that any of these victims were engaged in sex work. Even if they were, does that have anything to do with the value of their lives? Now, regardless of these debates, it would be a mistake to look at these these cases as an isolated incident. Earlier in February, a shooting 
A shocking video showed a 91-year-old Asian man violently shoved to the ground in Oakland, California's Chinatown. In late January in San Francisco, an 84-year-old immigrant from Thailand was fatally assaulted and later died. In another case, a 75-year-old Chinese-American woman was punched on her face while waiting to cross a road, yet she managed to hit back at her attacker with a wooden stick. Now, according to police data released by the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at California State University in San Bernardino, although overall hate crimes in the 16 American cities profile dropped by 7% in 2020, anti-Asian hate crime rose by 150% and New York City saw a spike of 830%. Unfortunately, it's not just in the U.S. In the UK, figures from the London Metropolitan Police show over 200 incidents of hate crime against people of East Asian appearance reported just between June and September 2020, almost doubling year on year. In Australia, according to a poll by a think tank, one third of the Chinese Australians said they have been called offensive names and more than one fifth said they have been, or less than one fifth said they have been physically threatened or attacked. In Canada, Vancouver police data shows anti-Asian hate crimes rose from a dozen in 2019 to 140 in 2020, an over 700 percent increase. The disturbing trend has got a lot of people asking why. Discrimination against Chinese in America is nothing new. In fact, it was institutionalized. The infamous Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 prohibited all immigration of Chinese laborers to the U.S. It remains the only law to have been implemented to prevent all members of a specific ethnic group from immigrating to the United States. It wasn't repealed until 1943 when it was replaced with the Magnuson Act, which allowed 105 Chinese to enter the U.S. per year. Chinese immigration later increased with the passage of the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952, which abolished direct racial barriers. But the idea of yellow peril has been revived throughout different periods of U.S. history against Japanese Americans who were interned during World War II, for example. But what accounts for this recent spike in anti-Asian attacks? Well, one recent study published by the American Journal of Public Health found that former U.S. President Donald Trump's first China virus tweet on March the 16th last year was directly responsible for a major increase in anti-Asian hashtags. According to the report, before his tweet, the dominant hashtag on Twitter was COVID-19, but after his tweet, it was Chinese virus, which saw a surge in use of over 8,000%. And people who used that term were most likely to post other anti-Asian content. Many media headlines have picked up on the studies and stats and uh, include important analysis on the real world damage that political rhetoric can cause. For example, this Washington Post piece from March the 19th includes input from Russell June, a professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State University. The article says June argued that Trump's repeated use of the phrase Chinese virus had a direct correlation with the rise in hate crimes. It demonstrates how words matter, according to June. He added the term Chinese virus racializes the disease so that it's not simply biological but Chinese in nature and stigmatizes the people so that Chinese are the disease carriers and the ones infecting others. Trump was reportedly still using the term China virus on Fox News the very night as the Atlanta spa shootings. The other question a lot of people are asking, why wasn't more done earlier? Now, Chinese-American journalist Connie Chun told CNN in an interview that the media has been miserably late in covering anti-Asian violence. We are insignificant and it's so apparent to all of us who are Asian. It does make people wonder if the voices of the Asian group were louder or heard sooner. Would the situation have been different? Would there have been fewer attacks against people of Asian heritage? Could lives have been saved? If you take a quick look back at March 2020, after Trump started using the China virus slur, there were some pretty big red flags waving already, and yet the White House 
defended Trump's position, calling the criticism surrounding the term fake outrage. A New York Times article from March the 18th last year was entitled Trump defends using Chinese virus label, ignoring growing criticism. It's not racist at all, the president was quoted as saying. The article adds, but the term has angered Chinese officials and a wide range of critics and China experts say labeling the virus that way will only ratchet up tensions between the two countries while resulting in the kind of xenophobia that American leaders should discourage. Asian Americans have reported incidents of racial slurs and physical abuse because of the Iranians' perception that China is the cause of the virus. So the question becomes even more chilling. There were actual signs that, uh, and statist, statistics that such crimes were already rising after Trump started using racial slurs. And yet, here we are a year later with discrimination and crimes against Asians still spiking. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said in a recent statement that thousands of incidents across the past year have perpetuated a centuries-long history of intolerance, stereotyping, scapegoating, exploitation and abuse. In a cartoon published by our network CGTN days ago, the Statue of Liberty asked an American kid what she wants to be when she grows up. The kid, with dark hair and an Asian appearance, replied, I don't know but I know what I don't want to be, Asian, she wrote down. In countries as diverse as the US, all ethnic groups are promised the right to live with equality and dignity, but until influential people speak and act responsibly, these will remain only concepts on paper. It's being called the invisible pandemic. Since early 2020, the U.S. has seen a sharp spike in assaults and robberies targeting Asian communities. As they approached me, they pulled me to the ground. Um, they punched me. Um, you know, I was resisting with them. I was yelling. I was screaming. Um, and what we are seeing, you know, is not only increasing of the numbers, but I guess uh, the seriousness of the attacks are getting uh, more and more are violent. Some say it is a deep-rooted problem that has plagued American society long before the COVID-19 pandemic. We are tired and sick and tired of all the anti-Asian hate sentiment, which has been in here present prior to COVID. I grew up with this. We also need to hold the system and government accountable for their failure to address uh, white supremacy and systemic racism that continue to perpetuate anti-blackness and anti-Asians and using us as wedges. The attacks put a damper on the Lunar New Year, which is typically a festive and busy time across Asian communities. Many seniors chose to stay at home, worried over being the next victims. Asian American women and elders were being targeted, um, often for cultural reasons. Um, they're reluctant to speak out to press charges. Hundreds have taken to the streets to protest against the attacks, with crowds not limited to Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. So it's important to show solidarity, important to show our political elected officials that we matter and that we care as Asian Americans. It doesn't make any difference what nationality you are. We need to stick together as a people, as humans. Period. Welcome back to Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point with me, Li Xin. I'm pleased to be joined from Ottawa, Canada, by Professor Chen Xiaobei from the Department of Sociology and Anthropology of Carleton University, Canada. From San Francisco, Andy Young, Vice President of Fujian in the Bay. And from Tokyo, Associate Professor Lim Tai Wei, Senior Research Fellow Adjunct from the National University of Sing Singapore. Welcome to all of you. Let me go to Professor Chen first and uh, later to Mr. Young. From your personal experience, have you personally encountered any abusive language or physical attacks over the past year? How close to home is this topic to you? Um, well, thank you for having me. I um, want to um, say that uh, 
in the past past year, I've been doing teaching mostly uh, at home online. So I have not uh, personally encountered uh, abusive language, um, but I've uh, of course uh, have been monitoring the reports of hate incidents and so on. And uh, it, there is a disturbing trend of uh, of sharp uh, rising um, uh, uh, incidences, but. Um, I want to say, though, that uh, it's also problematic to only focus on hate crimes and hate incidents on the streets because racism is a much uh, larger issue. Uh, we, the media report so far has been only focused on attacks, mm -hmm. but racism actually affects people at in many levels, and many of these uh, problems are quite invisible. For example, when uh, there is the scapegoating um narrative um circulating in our society in canada for example I, the one effect could be this question who do you work for so uh, chinese canadians will be automatically suspected that uh, you have divided loyalty that uh, you may work you may be working for the chinese government mm. now that kind of uh, 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 problems often may not be voiced Right? But it will still have an uh, impact on people's career, okay. on people's lives, and so on. But it's uh, it's very difficult to challenge. So uh, from my perspective, I think we should also talk more about the systemic uh, racism rather than only focus on hate crimes. Yeah. It's a very narrow focus. Okay, we, we, we will expand to that. It's just uh, for the time being we are talking about this. But I agree with you that there are a lot of invisible uh, discrimination that uh, overseas Chinese or overseas Asian communities are faced with. Let me go to uh, Mr. Yang, your personal experience uh, over the past year. So over the past year, I have a um, small business in San Francisco. I have a small restaurant and uh, my mm -hmm. restaurant was vandalized and broken in four times. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Please go ahead. Yes. Okay. Four times. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Four times within within the year. So ever since March um, till February of uh, this year, it was yeah, it was broken into and vandalized four times. And uh, as a kid growing up in the project, I was one of the few Chinese kids who made out of the hood. And um, coming from China as a thirteen year old, I had no idea about the definition of racism until I moved into a predominantly black neighborhood. And I feel like over the past 20 years of my uh, my life here in the U.S., uh, a lot oftentimes, you know, my encounters to to racism were having to having to, you know, be another minority. So I haven't really encountered any racism or any uh, racial slur used against me hmm. from a uh, white person. Most, you know, almost 99% of them was, you know, committed by another minority. So I feel like uh, the mainstream media is, is, is definitely downplaying the importance of, you know, focusing on the statistics. And uh, yeah, but anyways, I just want to stick to the, to the subject. My restaurant was vandalized four times and it was it was totally uh, heartbreaking, especially during COVID. We were struggling to uh, right. keep our business afloat. And I would definitely not imagine that this is the kind of uh, rate of, uh, you know, damage or crime that's inflicted on your restaurant before COVID uh, erupted, right? I mean, things must have not been like this, Mr. Yang. Right. Yeah, because I've been running my business at the uh, McAllister Street of San Francisco for the past six years mm. and then um you the know, past year was particularly once, bad yeah i mean might happen once for the past four years but you know not like last year it was mm. nearly every three months we'll have a break in we'll have wow. a uh, vandalism people smash the window and you know attack the restaurant and whatnot wow We'll talk a bit more mm -hmm. about that. Yeah, both of you so far have raised uh, very important points. But uh, Professor Lim, let me go to you. Uh, you live in Asia. Um, do you also have this kind of experience or you are m more or less observing what's happening in other parts of the world? Uh, yes, uh, I have lived in uh, many countries uh, over the uh, past few decades. And uh, fortunately, I have not uh, faced uh, personal uh, incidents uh, at all. 
Uh, however, I do approach uh, the subject matter mm -hmm. from an academic perspective. And uh, throughout uh, the uh, world history, uh, one of the courses that uh, I taught, uh, racism has always been a uh, consistent theme uh, and uh, thematic uh, subject matter uh, that is uh, rather prominent uh, in the uh, human societies and uh, uh, history. Uh, and therefore, as an educator, uh, it, uh, one thing that I notice is that uh, many societies have different uh, coping mechanisms mm -hmm. uh, in order to mitigate and handle uh, racism. But they do have one denominator in place. It is a common denominator in which all nations can work together uh, as a, uh, a non-detrimental uh, factor, which is to combat racism. And therefore, you can see uh, that it is a theme that is raised uh, in the United Nations, mm -hmm. part of the sustainable uh, sustainability development goals. Yes. And together, I think uh, that uh, this is a great opportunity for countries to work together, particularly yeah. since uh, we live in a very globalized uh, world where there's a lot of movements of people, whether it's migrants or for right. jobs or for many other reasons. And I think this is a great opportunity, particularly since also that after the pandemic, we are going to see uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, economic dislocations. Yeah. And uh, one of the uh, fallout from the economic dislocations uh, would be uh, racism, uh, in which uh, you uh, scapegoating okay. or blaming others for economic ills. Okay. So this is a good chance for all countries to work together. Absolutely, that's why we're talking. Unfortunately, it's taken so much damage to the Asian community for this to become a hot topic. But uh, Professor Chen, what do you think are the forces driving the spike of uh, you know racism, either visible or invisible, against uh, Asian communities? Um. Well, I first I want to say that uh, this uh, wave of, uh, you know, what uh, now in the past week has been flagged as anti-Asian racism uh, is uh, actually has a specific uh, focus on the Chinese, right? So um, at that level, we need to understand that uh, it is specifically targeting Chinese. Unfortunately, East uh, uh, Asian um, Canadians and the Americans got attacked too because they look like Chinese. So I think we need to get that, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, have that clearly understood. And uh, with that in mind, I think uh, uh, certainly the geopolitical tensions between uh, China and the US and uh, to some extent uh, the West is um, very much uh, the background that cannot be uh, excluded uh, from uh, uh, from understanding this uh, right hostility against the uh, uh, against the Chinese and against the uh, East Asians. And the pandemic, of course, is another big factor. It's a time of crisis um, that uh, you know people um, want to find the scapegoat to to blame, uh, and the politicians uh, irresponsibly are peddling hate for their own for their own benefits. Mm. Andy. What is your take on this question? Yeah, what do you think? What do you think has really driven these people to break into your restaurant again and again? And why uh, people of other minorities are actually doing this more than the white people? To you, in particular, in particular, to, oh, to, to you know, yeah, um, your group. You know, first of all, I feel like um, getting back to the question is there's like an economic disparity, um, and also we we have a lack of leadership and lack of uh, representation from the media because, you know, the Western media, you know, for years they've been downplay and they, they portrayed us in certain way. We are deemed to be uh, inferior, submissive and passive. So that kind of gives a, a, uh, a pathway to a lot of criminals, you know, to take advantage of the fact that, you know, everything is predetermined. When you see a Chinese person walking down the street especially they are preying on the old and the weak now. So we are the young generation of Chinese America here in San Francisco. I feel like over the past 200 years, you know, we, we've been deemed as inferior and, you know, easy to pick on. It has to change. And um, this, is, this is not the first time that's been happening to our community. Mm -hmm. it's, it's only when someone who's, who happened to be white shot up Atlanta, and killed eight people and then six of them 
happened to be Asian, and then that made it to the national headline. But this has been going for the past 200 years. This has been going for the 20 years of, of my life here in the city of San Francisco. Constant breakdowns, constant uh, robberies, and constant assault on our elderly in the community is getting out of control. So what contributes to, to, to the hatred, I feel like it has partially has to do with Donald Trump's antagonizing rhetoric towards China, mm -hmm. labeled COVID as, uh, you know, cone flu and China virus, mm -hmm. and partially has to do with the unemployment rate. You know, like uh, Daniel D. came when he had a Congress hearing, he, he specifically stated that um, Asians are statistically insignificant when it comes to voting. Wow. Meaning, you know, we our vote doesn't really count when it comes to politics. And we're getting schooled by both the left and the right because you, you got to understand how the mainstream media are controlled by the left here. All the fake news for years, ever since I, I stepped my foot on the U.S. soil, they started making a lot of, you know, start, yeah. you know, falsifying and making a lot of false accusations about China. And, and that's something that, okay. that's being it's institutionalized. It's, yeah. And uh, I'll, I, before I finish my statement, I'd like to bring an example. I, I, well, my mentor, Z Man, that's my big homie. I took him to China for the first time in 2019. Mm. And uh, he was appalled how his misconceptions and misperceptions about China, mm. it was how contradicting it was. It was it was like a yeah. mind blowing experience for him. So anyway, the, yeah. Yeah, it shows the role of the media as well in in not informing people comprehensively and, and, and adequately. We have some viewer comment here. I'm going to bring that in and see what the viewer has been saying to our conversation. So from uh, Jay in New Zealand, I think it's fueled the racism is fueled by intergenerational trauma and I think it will continue because it justifies the disgusting reasons they attacked the weak and it's historically entrenched in America culture. Professor Lim, any comment? Yes, uh, I think uh, racism has been a very long uh, part of a very long history of uh, humankind. And in every society, uh, there had been incidents uh, of uh, racism. And uh, coming from uh, ASEAN, uh, I'm glad to say that uh, the region celebrates uh, diversity. Uh, you can see that the ASEAN comes together, 10 different countries. Each country has a plethora of uh, races, ethnicities, and religion. Uh, and uh, they have made it a point. They're not perfect, but they have made it a point uh, to have a harmonious uh, coexistence, uh, to be able to celebrate diversity, the different cultures that bring color uh, as well as innovation uh, to uh, economics, cultural uh, diversity, and many other spheres of life. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the U.S. Uh, would also, the U.S. and the West would also have their own coping mechanism. It requires a lot of efforts. It requires time. Uh, and I think it requires also a societal consensus. Now, there are two yeah. long-term uh, ways in yeah, which just, just uh, this uh, can yeah, be Professor mitigated. Professor Lim, just a moment. Time is very limited. I'm going to bring up this cartoon, which is very relevant and very interesting as well. It's uh, by the comedian and host of the satirical show, talk show by uh, uh, Trevor Noah. He made a post on Instagram about the media's reaction. Let's take a look at this. Um, white guy, the picture says, white guy, comma, shoots and kills eight people. Media says, alleged shooter was Coldplay fan or lover of fine white with the caption like clockwork um, Andy Andy let me get your take first well how do you look at what is he trying to say and do you re does it resonate with you well it doesn't resonate with me in a certain way um, I feel like what he's trying to say is he's he's being satirical about the situation how how white supremacy does exist in our society and uh, how they are trying to to downplay the uh, the serious seriousness of, of his mm -hmm. his atrocity committed in our community mm -hmm. and that's that's how I look at it and uh, I don't really have any further thought on okay. that okay professor Chen well, uh, I think uh, that uh, certainly is uh, a good illustration about uh, the systemic uh, racism 
that uh, you know it's uh, how it it manifests itself in 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 the in the media coverage. But I must say though that uh, what is missing here is a gender analysis. I especially appreciate uh, uh, earlier in your uh, segment of the uh, of the program you pointing to gender. I think that that's often a perspective that's uh, not very prominent in. Uh, in analysis about the Atlanta shooting tragedy, as well as in the spike of anti-Asian uh, racism uh, in this uh, last uh, last year, because uh, violence is caused by anti-women misogynistic hatred yeah. against the women. We, that's the part of the, uh, 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 the 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 reason for the for the shooting. Okay. Yeah. And look at the so we also see that two thirds of the reported incidents came from women. So it's not just the seniors uh, mm. were are targeted; women as well. Yeah. So we need to have that analysis. Yeah, time is really to, really limited. I'm going to give each each and every one of you the opportunity to give your suggestion. What do you think is the most urgent thing that has to be done in order to address this problem, um, Professor Lin? First. Okay, uh, just now you made a uh, popular cultural reference uh, in the example, and I feel that po co popular cultural references can be a force for good, especially in the social media generation. So this is an opportunity in the social media in the social media sphere, as well as popular cultural industry, for the conservatives and the progressives to work together to combat racism together. Thank you. Hmm. Andy? So... As closing, I'd like to encourage everyone, it doesn't matter which party you support. If you are Asian, if you are Chinese, we must come together as one because only together we stand and we have the strength to carry on, to reach out to more people. We want to show them the strength. And on March 27th, we are hosting one of the biggest rally here in San Francisco. We're going to march down from uh, City Hall all the way down to Union Square. We are projecting about 5,000 people to turn out. It's going to be one of the historical Asian civil rights movement. So I just want to encourage more young people to get out there, stand up and speak up in the face of racism, in the face of injustice. You know, the perpetrators and the racists, they come in all colors and shapes. Mm -hmm. So please, when you see something, do something. When you see something, say something. Never worry about the consequences. I'm, I'm not saying you don't have to evaluate the environment, but the time has changed now. Okay. We are together as one. We are let go of all of our disputes and differences. Okay. Yeah. Professor Chen. I think the Asian Americans and the Asian Canadians need to find our own voice and we need to dare to speak up. So in all the while, right now, we are organizing a vigil to protest against the anti-Asian racism and the anti-women violence. This is a political action among many that we are taking yeah. to, to call attention to these problems, to make Canada a better place for everyone. Yeah. Well, many thanks to my three guests, uh, Chen Xiaobei, Professor Chen Xiaobei, joining us from Ottawa, Canada, Andy, Andy Young, joining us from San Francisco, and Professor Lin Taiwei, joining us from Tokyo. And uh, with that, we come to the end of this edition of Headline Buster. I hope that uh, this issue will be in the spotlight for some time to come so that we can keep the pressure on so that the situation can have the opportunity to be redressed. Many thanks for following this edition of Headline Buster. You've got the point, and thanks for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Comments? <clears throat> Let me see. Jay in New Zealand. Okay, we already responded to hello, by the way. I hope you enjoyed the show today. How is it? In, from Fiona Sim, imperialist anti-China rhetoric pushed by the West is the reason for the rise in Sinophobia, including Xinjiang propaganda. I tend to agree with this one.
I'm from Bob Builder. Those that hope to see China downfall will be disappointed, but you will be entertained by another country downfall instead. Well, I think let's not hope any country collapse here because I don't think it's realistic. You know, I think he was talking about the United States. The United States is not going to collapse anytime soon, and we obviously don't want to see that because that's going to be disastrous for people in America and for people elsewhere in the world as well, for China as well. We have so many reaction、uh, interactions together. So, yeah, it's it's not going to be entertaining for anybody if、uh, there's a downfall of of、uh, you know other major country or any country in this world. We don't want we don't want that. Well, from Lilo Leist saying China is implementing digital tyranny upon its people. That's abuse. I don't know what you're talking about.、Uh, you mean everybody's being, you know, controlled or data is, you know, being collected or whatsoever? I think this, you know, I think you have to look at what's happening everywhere around the world. For instance, if you're using、uh, Apple or if you're using Google, your data is collected too. Maybe not by the government, but possibly also by the government, but by big capital, big money. What are you going to say to that? I think the important thing is to say that how do you do the best to protect people's privacy while giving them the kind of、uh, convenience that modern technology can provide. Meanwhile, also talk about、um, you know how do you use these data in a way that brings benefit to people.、Um, for instance, in China, everyone you ask. They can tell you that they feel extremely safe, especially foreigners who live in China. They feel very, very safe because instantly criminals can be can be identified and can be caught. For me, I suddenly don't have any worry if my children go out in the middle of the night, and I think that's a great advantage. So there are ups and downs about the prevalence of digital digital devices and data. It depends on how you use it. For you to say, you know, this is just bad, I think that's also an abusive、uh, way of thinking as well. From Colton Snyder, rhetoric and labeling can be damaging. Hopefully, the conversation on anti-racism and、uh, persecution of any form takes hold throughout the entire world until we all, as a people, finally live in harmony. I think that is the ultimate goal, and I think we should definitely work、uh, towards that goal. But I think it's going to take a long time until we can really. Respect each other's differences and say, "Hey, that's the way you are. This is the way I am." But it doesn't matter. We can all live on this planet together. I think human beings are not are not are not used to the idea that people who are different than us can be the same. You know, we can live,、um, we can we can coexist. I think you know sometimes we have to make a conscious effort. To make that kind of choice, so it's not easy. It's going to take some time. All right, more comments coming, more questions.、Mm. Yeah. Well, I see a a lot of discussion here. Li Pai Han, Asian hate is so bad. It is, but、uh, I would say hate based on race or based on religion or any of this kind of、uh, dem demographic group is bad. So let's not hate anybody. Not not against the black. Not against Asians. Not against people of different religion, religious belief. Yeah. Why can't we live in peace and harmony? All right. I see the conversation getting alive on its own, and、uh, people are talking about other issues as well, other than、um, racial discrimination. So I'll leave it there.
I'll let you continue talking. I hope you enjoyed the show today. Yeah? I'll see you next time when Headline Buster is going live again. Okay? Bye-bye.